So we're going to start with our second session this morning and before lunch. So we're going to do until just uh, after one. And then we have lunch. And then we reconvene at 2 or 2.30. 2.30. Um, so I'm happy to introduce Brady Bowman, who is an associate professor of philosophy at the Pennsylvania State University and author of Hegel and the Metaphysics of Absolute Negativity with Cambridge University Press 2012 and numerous articles on various figures and topics in classical German philosophy with two forthcoming articles, The Vocation of Philosophy, Hegel on Speculative Science and the Human Good and um, Sorry, I forgot the other one. Yeah. Sorry. And uh, he's the vice president of the International Hegel Gesellschaft and since 2022 co editor with Birgit Zankorn of the Hegel, of the journal Hegel Studien. Thank you. Yes. Um, can you hear me properly? Yeah. Okay, it's a bit quiet. Is this, how about this? I'll try to speak up a little bit. Is that good? Because I can't really tell from here whether it's, huh? Speak closer to the mic. Yeah, well, I'm going to have to be like that. You know? <laughs> Once I start bending over to read, you know, page, it'll be a little bit better. Um, oh, yeah. Well, they're on the technique. Um, so I would like to say thank you to, uh, Christoph Heilbig, Wolfram, and Thomas Kurana for organizing this wonderful conference and deciding to include me in it. Um, special thanks, obviously, to Thomas Kurana uh, for organizing this. And although I know that many people besides Isabel are in the background supporting all of this, uh, thanks to Isabel by name and to the others um, by intention. I can relate uh, to what uh, Katarina said at the beginning of her talk yesterday. Um, I work mainly on metaphysics and of knowledge and Hegel and other sort of post-Kantian philosophy. I haven't worked a lot on the practical side of things. And I certainly haven't worked before on this topic. Oh yeah, I see it yeah, better. So it's a, it's a bit of a, of a foray for me. Um, the title is Illegality of the Good. That's the title that I gave it. I'm not even sure that the title is quite as descriptive anymore as I'd like it to be. What I'm really doing here is sort of trying on for size a certain variety of constitutivist thought and see to see how far I can kind of get with it in discussing some of these issues in post-Kantian philosophy. Uh, so please, if it gets quiet again, then please just somehow signal to me that you're not able to hear. Um, Thank you, Andrew. So the paper basically has three parts. This is a short introduction about uh, some problems with what I think of, or I'm calling here a principles first approach to moral theory. Uh, then there'll be two middle sections where I talk about Jacobi and Hegel uh, in turn, and then some concluding remarks, uh, mainly on Hegel's relationship to Jacobi and how we might think of that from a kind of broadly speaking constitutivist point of view. So then uh, part one, post-Kantian ethics and problems with principles first approaches to moral theory. Constitutivism, according to Paul Katsafana's succinct characterization of it, is quote, the view that we can justify fundamental normative claims by showing that agents become committed to those claims merely in virtue of acting. And this quote, two leading proponents of the view are Christine Korsgaard and David Velleman, who, however, develop it in different directions. Korsgaard takes a principles-based approach, her most distinctive claim being that action constitutively requires the agent's commitment to the categorical imperative. I know that she's softened that claim in various ways, but I think that's the most distinctive one. Velleman, on the other hand, prioritizes aims. He argues that rational agents, just by acting, commit themselves to the aim of self-understanding. In his words, quote, the aim of making sense is constitutive of agency, end of quote. Of these two brands of constitutivism, 
Developments provides the more illuminating perspective on the question we're concerned with at this conference. That is, if philosophical commitment to the unity of freedom and the moral law is among the defining features of Kantian and post-Kantian thought, how are we to understand the interest those philosophers take in the reality of actions that are free, but either immoral, or whose undeniable positive moral value would seem to violate accepted moral principles? In this talk, I draw on some of Vellman's insights to explore the relation of freedom, moral principles, and other forms of normativity in the thought of Jacobi and Hegel. Korsgaard and Vellman both understand themselves as engaged in what are broadly Kantian projects. Korsgaard's principles-based constitutivism is probably closer in spirit to Kant's own moral theory, and I'd say confront some of the same prima facie challenges, one of these being the apparent suggestion that immoral actions are really failed actions and failures of agency. To make it a condition on free action and rational agency that it be guided by the categorical imperative seems to be setting an implausibly high bar, Pache um, Wolfram. an implausibly high bar. Moreover, it makes a riddle of the imputability of evil or immoral actions. The view also confronts a further difficulty that, as Jonathan Dancy has argued, is common to all principled approaches to ethical theory, namely that they tend to deny the possibility of real moral disagreement or of conflicting duties. Principled theories are ones that explain moral reasons as being either themselves principles or as derivable from principles, for example, by iterative specification, by integrating rules, governing exceptions, and so forth. Dancy argues that among other defects, such an approach must take the position that every moral action, every moral situation is properly, properly determinable by exactly one principle. But then apparent conflicts of duties, apparent tensions among competing moral reasons are just that, mere appearance, at the bottom of which a determining principle is always to be had, one that will resolve disagreement. As Dancy sums it up, there may be a conflict in you, which will probably be about what the relevant principle is, but there can be no conflict between reasons. All that I want to say about this position, Dancy concludes, is that we would need a very strong argument before accepting any such thing. End of quote. We find hints of this same reservation in the writings of both Jacobi and Hegel. Hegel certainly acknowledges the possibility of real moral disagreement. In the case of the ancient world, at least, he seems to believe that real collisions of duty, instances of ethical tragedy, are virtually inevitable. Arguably, one of the chief lessons to be drawn from his famous discussion of conscience, evil, and its forgiveness in the phenomenology of spirit is that actual conscientious agents cannot coexist unless there is a way for them to relate to each other ethically that is nonetheless beyond moral principles. In the case of moral disagreement, that is, there has to be some way of affirming each other. who is right and who is wrong. That way, of course, is forgiveness. So unsurprisingly, I guess, there is already a prima facie case against interpreting Hegel as committed to anything like to anyone familiar with the skepticism about general first principles and their deductive application to individual cases and with his corresponding insistence on our quasi-perceptual relation to moral facts. Now, it would, to my mind, be equally implausible to suggest that Hegel would have embraced a view like Dancy's to make a similar point, this time focusing on the issue of ethical revision and creativity. So, Jacobi on the context dependency of moral action and meaning. So I begin with a passage from uh, Jacobi's open letter to Fichte. It's a long one. It's uh, the first one on your handout. Hegel himself cites the passage in two different discussions of Jacobi, each time in full and each time praising it for its fine and pure expression. 
despite Hegel's overall criticism of Hegel's, uh, of Jacobi's position, I don't think that Hegel is being insincere in this praise. So here's the, the quotation in full. Yea, I am the atheist and the godless one who against the will that wills nothing will lie as Desdemona lied with her dying breath. Lie and deceive as Pilates did when he pretended to be Orestes, murder as Timurion did, or break law and oath like Epaminondas or Johann de Witt. Commit suicide like Otto, perpetrate sacri sacrilege like David. Yea, I would pluck ears of wheat on the Sabbath just because I'm hungry and because the law is made for man, not man for the law. I know with the most sacred certainty that I have within me that the privilegium agratiandi, that is the privilege of granting pardon for such crimes against the pure letter of the absolutely universal law of reason, is man's true right of majesty, the seal of his worth, of his divine nature." End of quote. Following on the heels of this oration, Jacobi affirms his commitment to what he calls the moral principle of reason, which he acknowledges being called the highest in concept, das höchste im Begriffe. However, according to Jacobi's formulation, the moral principle consists in, quote, man's agreement, that is Einstimmigkeit, man's agreement with himself, constant unity. So he's not acknowledging the Kantian conception of the moral principle of reason as consisting in the imperative to act only from maxims capable of generalization. Jacobi is wary of any understanding of moral worth or rightness that would make it depend on its formal properties, believing it tends toward a kind of moralistic despotism that is fundamentally incompatible with living moral experience and with what makes actions morally valuable. The question then is how to understand what precisely Jacobi means to affirm under the description agreement with oneself, constant unity. What does his rhetorical catalog of examples tell us in this regard? First and most obviously, they tell us that the moral value of one and the same kind of action, lying, deception, fratricide, suicide, promise breaking, and so forth, can vary drastically depending on the context in which the action is performed. What is wrong in one context can be right in a different context. So before we can assess an action's moral value, we need a suitably thick description of the action and its context, presumably one that will involve some element of narrativity, as do all the instances Jacobi cites as examples. But that's not all they tell us. Beyond this general point about the holistic nature of moral uh, worth and moral judgment, we're supposed to recognize the historical and literary personages as being in their different ways morally excellent. What makes them excellent is that in responding to the situation, they act in ways that are once morally innovative in reversing the action's default value, ways that express their individual history and character, and that also transforms the meaning of the situation itself. For example, by committing suicide, Otto, who has just suffered defeat on the battleground, managed to achieve what he had initially to ho uh, hoped to achieve by military victory, namely to prevent civil war in Rome. In breaking the law that regulates the um, Biotarch's term of office, Epaminondas saves the existence of an independent Boeotian legal and constitutional order. In breaking the law that prescribes rest on the Sabbath, Jesus demonstrates the reality of an ethical order that transcends positive law. And similarly, in the remaining cases, these agents act not from any specific principle, but from their commitment to something they hold to constitute a value so fundamental that in its absence, there would be no sense in trying to uphold the moral and legal norms. Jacobi's examples could be taken to suggest that he held a view akin to moral particularism. Like Jacobi, the moral particularist is also struck by the fact that the features of an action that count as moral reasons for or against it, and whether they count for or and whether they count for or existent, are strongly context dependent. For the particularist, what is right or wrong in a particular action depends as much on time, place, and setting 
as what aesthetically succeeds or fails in a work of art and is little susceptible and is as little susceptible to explanation in terms of rules. Without that, however, being in any way detrimental to the objectivity uh, or leading to any kind of facile relativism. Although I don't think that we ought to read Jacobi in that way, the interpretation does have something, I think, going for it, and it may be illuminating to consider it in some more detail. First, there's Jacobi's general allergy against the enshrinement of deductive reasoning as the be-all and end-all of human cognition. His objection to so-called explanations that pretend to determine or derive the particular case from some putatively more fundamental universal principle. Then there's his insistence on the perception-like immediacy of moral certainty, whose deliverances would thus be similarly bound to particular contexts that give rise to them. In fact, Hegel seems to understand Jacobi as embracing just such a position when he argues that Jacobi's ethical views promote arbitrary and unprincipled um, actions and decisions. From Hegel's point of view, Jacobi leans much too far in the direction of individual particularity, which Hegel equates with subjectivity and caprice, and gives far too little weight to substantive universal norms which Hegel equates with objectivity and bindingness. Now, moral particularism is not a form of subjectivism. Ethics without principles is not immediately a contradiction in terms. And Jacobi, as the realist and theorist of objective feelings that he is, certainly does not consider himself to be recommending the attitudes Hegel seems him as expressing and promoting. But it's not hard to understand the tendency to view both particularism and Jacobi himself that way. So indirectly, at least, Hegel's criticism could count in support of attributed to Jacobi a form of moral particularism. Yet be that as it may, I don't believe the particularist viewpoint fits the facts of Jacobi's case. If Jacobi did hold a kind of no principles view of morality, then he would betray a degree of self misunderstanding when he affirms in the passage, passage cited above agreement with self, constant unity, as constituting what he calls the moral principle of reason. If his examples tell us anything at all about what specifically he affirms under that description, it cannot be <clears throat> that he thought that there were no principles. It's here, I think, that we can find help from Velleman's brand of constitutivism, which acknowledges the reality and importance of moral principles, but without making them constitutive of agency. Let me now explain that. Velleman pursues the constitutivist project of identifying, quote, a motive that's constitutive of agency as a way of finding, quote, a substantive criterion of correctness for action. To put it another way, if, quote, action is behavior performed for reasons, then what Bellman seeks is to identify some very basic motive such that to have that motive is to be susceptible to reasons for acting in general, that is to be an agent. The motive Bellman identifies is the motive of self-understanding, the motive to act in a way that makes sense. By this, he doesn't mean that all action aims at self understanding as an external goal, as though we acted in order to achieve some kind of self-understanding. Rather, it's a criterion for when a piece of behavior counts as an action, namely when performing it brings about a state of affairs that makes sense in its context. Bellman invites us to think about agents as being, uh, think of agents as being like improvisational actors rather than performing according to an already written script, which he's trying to interpret, the improvisational actor is trying to bring about new states of affairs that are sensitive to a range of given constraints. For example, the character, the scenario, uh, the moves that the other improvisational actors in the ensemble have already made. Here's a quotation that's uh, on your handout. Improvisation can serve as a model for action, he writes, because the behavior that rises to the status of action is the behavior that we make up as we go along. 
And the considerations whose guidance constitutes our behavior as improvisation, as made up, and hence as action, thereby qualify as reasons for acting because action just is behavior performed for reasons. End of quote. It's just that when we are authentically acting, the intelligibility constraints are not given on the basis of arbitrary agreement in a fictional setting, but by the types of situations in which we find each other and the beliefs we have about our own character, the sequence of intentions and events leading up to the present situation, our particular aims and desires, and so forth. To clarify his point, Velleman draws on an insight from, from Anscombe's analysis of intention. What qualifies action as autonomous in distinction to mere behavior is the relation in which we stand to them in forethought. In the case of mere behavior, my relation to it in forethought is that of prediction. Velleman likens this to reading one's future by observing signs and indications in the present of what is likely to come. Like when I say, I'm going to be sick, by contrast, my relation to action and forethought, to action and forethought, is that of decision, which Velleman likens in turn to writing one's future. I quote again: "When the fact that we are going to do something makes us think so, then we clearly have not made it up. The case in which we have made up the fact that we are going to do something is the case in which our thinking makes it so." And in the latter case, but not in the former, our behavior will amount to an autonomous action. That's why we think of ourselves as the authors of our actions, but not of our other behavior. And it's also the respect in which we resemble improvisational actors, who are the authors of what they do on stage. End of quote. In the meantime, such writing or improvising of our future is constituted by the aim of intelligibility, of bringing about through intention a state of affairs in which we can understand ourselves as an integral whole person, as the same author. In this way, then, my character and past actions, to some degree probably comparable to uh, Course Guard's concept of practical identity, serve both as a guide to and a constraint on the actions I decide to perform. I'll go ahead and read this somewhat longish quote. It's also on your handout. When the agent thinks about what it would make sense for him to do in light of his circumstances, attitudes, and attributes, he cannot honestly purport to be reading his future in them, since what he does is going to depend on what he sees as making sense in light of them. His pre-existing motives will be joined and their balance potentially altered by the very motive that leads him to think about them as clues to his next action, since that motive will incline him to do what those clues render it most intelligible for him to do. The very thoughts by which the agent might try to read his future are thus thoughts by which he cannot help but write it, because they will help to determine how the balance of his motives will tip, end of quote. Anscombe's observation and the use Velleman makes of it both have a high degree, I think, of descriptive obviousness. So it's unsurprising to find Jacobi making a similar use of it when he insists on the same feature of intentional action in his criticism of Spinoza's fatalism, the next quotation. If all there is are efficient causes and no final ones, he writes, then of everything in nature, the faculty of thought is merely an onlooker whose only business is to accompany the, uh, the mechanism of the acting forces. The inventor of the clock did not really invent it, but merely looked on as it arose from blindly developing forces. We merely believe that we acted from anger, love, generosity, or rational decisions, mere delusion. What Jacobi intends to uh, carry the weight here is the plain absurdity of this reduction of intentional action to mere behavior, its incompatibility with our ordinary experience of ourselves as agents. Quote, if anyone is able to suppose this to be true, Jacobi concludes, I would not know how to refute his opinion. Similarly, Velleman, without self-deception, then you cannot purport to read, that is, to be a merely observant predictor of your future at all. 
sends us back to Jacobi's acknowledgement of the moral principle of reason, namely agreement with oneself. In a related context, he writes, that element in the human being that distinctly expresses the I is what he calls his reason, Kanunf. And that is his reason. Now, if the I agrees with itself in its actions, then it agrees with its reason. Therefore, if the I acts in such a way as to agree, agree with its own inclinations and the laws of their possible agreement, then, it's in, then it is governing itself. Now, it's a clear description of the same thing that Delaman describes as intention and autonomy. Jacobi's parable of the two Spartans, Spertias and Bulas, is interesting in this connection. They come to Persia from Sparta to offer their lives to Xerxes in exchange for the lives of two Persian mess messengers the Spartans had wrongly killed. Impressed by the two Spartans' courage and integrity, Hulares, a satrap, and then Xerxes himself welcomed them and tried to persuade them to remain in Persia. But Spertias and Bulas refused, quote, how could we live here, leave our country, our laws and people, to are such that, in order to die for them, we have voluntarily undertaken this long journey? Here's Jacobi's commentary. Spertias and Bulis may well have been less skilled in thinking and reasoning than the Persians, nor indeed did they appeal to their understanding or their fine judgment to uh, justify themselves, but only to things and their inclination toward these things. Nor did they boast of any virtue. They only avowed the sense of their hearts, their affect. They had no philosophy, or their philosophy was merely history, merely Geschichte. Svetias and Bulas do not expect Hulares and Xerxes uh, to understand what, is, what it is in particular that makes Spartan life and laws indispensable to their making their life and actions intelligible to themselves. Nor do they appeal to general moral principles. They merely point out that taking up life in Persia would be unintelligible as the conclusion of their long voluntary journey to sacrifice their lives there. In pointing this out, however, they do implicitly expect acknowledgement of the more fundamental constitutive aim of seeking intelligibility in and of action. And it's implicitly a consequence of this constitutive aim that Spartan life and its laws are indispensable to them. To return to the long passage I quoted at the beginning of this section, I think we now have the resources to interpret Jacobi's own conclusion there, namely that, quote, the law was made for man and not man for the law. This means that the codification of reasons for action in the explicitly moral form of rules, principles, etc., is posterior and subordinate to the free act of improvising an action that makes one intelligible in the first instance to oneself in a new, novel, ethically challenging situation. Morality is neither prior to nor uniquely entailed by action. It is neither pri the primary guide for action nor the primary and unique standard of judging actions. So while the action Jacobi cites, the actions that Jacobi cites as examples are, in fact, on his view, morally motivated and morally excellent ones, it's not the cause or insofar as they are autonomous that they are morally excellent. Their moral value is not equivalent to their being the result of rational self-governance. They're autonomous inasmuch as they realize the constitutive aim of contextually determinate intelligibility. And they are morally excellent because the way they make sense is in the service of the diverse and not always strictly moral value commitments that each of the illustrative uh, personages reckons as unconditional in his or her life, a reason for going on. That's the end of the first part on Jacobi. A bit odd to be reading from this. I'm sort of leaning into the microphone and also kind of, you know, <laughs> squinting down at the page. So. Okay, so I come to Hegel's world historical individuals. And uh, in order to say something about the role of wickedness in rational progress. <clears throat> 
So let me start by acknowledging that from a contemporary ethical, sociological, and historical, historiographical perspective, Hegel's notion of world historical individuals or heroes belongs among the less appealing elements of his thought. I think that many people will feel that. However, it's vital to understanding how he sees the relation between reason, morality, and freedom. Hegel believes that as a matter of historical fact, individuals have emerged at moments of historical upheaval and epical transition, whose pursuit of their own particular passions and aims aligns, aligns with what he calls the truth of their time and world as it, as it were the coming res die nächste Gattung that was already present inwardly. Um, now, a longish quote also on your handout. We must therefore recognize world historical individuals, the heroes of a time, as possessing insight. For while this more advanced spirit is the interior soul of all individuals, it is, a, is, a, it is an unconscious interiority of which the great men make them conscious. And so the others follow these conductors of souls, Seelenführer, where they feel the irresistible force with which their own inner spirit presses toward them, end of quote. Yeah. In a way, it, does, it doesn't get much worse than that in this sense, yeah, it's a kind of heroic monumental historiography, but, but I want to make something of this that, that goes in, in rather a different and more universal direction. Crucially for our context, Hegel also believes that such individuals are justified in their passions and actions in a way that transcends moral evaluation. Subjecting them to moral criticism would be petty as well as misguided, since their actual significance and greatness lies elsewhere. In this context, Hegel repeats his bon mot from the discussion of evil and forgiveness in the phenomenology, saying, nobody is a hero to his valet de chambre, but not because the one is not a hero, but because the other is a valet de chambre. Remarks like this, I think, make it obvious that Hegel does not think the constitution of rat rational agency entails implicit or explicit commitment to specifically moral norms. He recognizes reasons for action that are not just non-moral, but directly immoral. Indeed, he seems to regard the moral standpoint itself as narrow and limited to what he characterizes as the ordinary situations of private life, in regard to which a state's laws and customs, die Sitten, fully suffice to settle the question which contents are good or not good, right or wrong. Once, and to the extent that the contents that constitute the substance of a form of ethical life, the values, norms, collective aims, and institutions, so on, are given, it's vital that the participants in that life regard them with an attitude of unconditional reverence if that form of life is to have reality and endure. Uh, so there is uh, definitely, let's say, you know, a deeply functional, indispensable role for the moral attitude. But as I understand Hegel, morality just is that attitude of unconditional reverence and respect, an attitude that has to presuppose its given contents, but up which it would be foolish to expect that it could either generate or justify them. So while he acknowledges the importance of respect for the moral law in the context of what, in analogy to Kuhn's notion of normal science, we might call normal ethical life, Unlike Kant, he's far from making such respect the source and measure of human dignity. In words that echo those of Jacobi, Hegel affirms the capacity for breaking the law and taking responsibility, his word is literally schuld, for one's own actions into the very calling, the very bestimmung of the human race. And I quote at length, the human being is an end in himself only by virtue of the divine element, das Göttliche, that is in him by virtue of that which from the beginning has been called reason, and insofar as it is active and self-determining freedom. But here we have to say that individuals, insofar as they are left to their own freedom, you have a Freiheit anheimgegeben, I think anheimgegeben is a little stronger. Here we have to say that individuals, insofar as they are left to their own freedom, are responsible for moral and religious corruption and for the weakening of morality and religion. 
This is the seal of a human being's absolute high vocation, namely that he know what is good and evil. And that responsibility, that should, is what willing is, be it the willing of the good or the willing of the evil. End of quote. Between the two leading contemporary versions of constitutivism, Velleman's is clearly the one that has the most affinity with, or at least is most compatible with, Hegel's conception of human agency. The passionate individuals that draw Hegel's attention are acting with the aim of intelligibility, the aim of making sense to and of themselves. They are following the inner logic of their character, and just to that extent, they are autonomous agents. Whether or not their actions are moral is a further question that we cannot answer merely by deciding on their degree of autonomy. And it's not merely this feature of Velleman's approach that brings it into conversation with Hegel, but also Velleman's emphasis on the improvisational, that is to say, the creative dimension of action, and that's what I want to talk about now. To illustrate what I mean, I'd like to consider two cases of contrasting figures of agency. The first case is that of Cato and Caesar, then that of Antigone and Socrates. Let's take Cato, the paragon of Roman Republican virtue. Hegel says of him that the idea of his state and country constituted the ultimate purpose of his whole world. I quote, his individuality vanished in the face of this idea. It was the preservation, life, and survival of this idea alone that he asked for, and this was something he was able to bring about himself. To beg for survival or eternal life for his own individuality was something that never or only seldomly occurred to him. Cato did not turn to Plato's Phaedo until after what for him had been the supreme order of things, his world, his republic, had been destroyed. And a quote. The unconditional subordination of individual particularity to a substantial concrete universal is for Hegel the hallmark of the moral attitude and the worldview that goes with it. That attitude and the concrete, in this case, Roman Republican values to which it committed him guide Cato in all his actions. He acts with the implicit aim of intelligibility in the framework of what to him is the supreme order of things. Given this framework and the fact of its destruction, Cato's suicide is a final act of sense-making. For Cato, the destruction of the Republic robs all further action of the very possibility of meaningfulness. His suicide is meaningful, intelligible, precisely in that it is a final negative assertion of commitment to the constitutive aim of action in the acknowledgement that the concrete possibility of pursuing that aim in any real concrete form has been annulled. If freedom is being at one with oneself in the other, as Hegel says, and if intelligibility is the highest form of such freedom, then Cato's suicide is an act of freedom and in the Roman scheme of things, also an act of the highest virtue. I think we could uh, interestingly and usefully con uh, contrast or compare here the case of uh, Plenty Coups in the work by um, Jonathan Lear on Radical Hope. Um, I think it's quite com comparable and yet a very different kind of story that, that um, then develops from the point of destruction on. Caesar, Cato's antagonist on the stage of world history is, of course, also his moral opposite, a man consumed by personal ambition to whom status is everything, country, and morals nothing. I would rather be first here in this barbarian village, he's reported to have said, rather than be second at Rome. Caesar acts towards, uh, towards the same underlying constitutive aim as Cato, namely the aim of self-understanding. Though in his case, the logic of sense-making produces a career that is in almost every respect dissimilar to that of Cato. However, beyond this individual difference between the two men, there's a further and deeper difference in their relation to history. As Hegel sees it, and here it's the basic shape of the view that is important, not the details of the historical inter interpretation of the Roman Empire, as Hegel sees it, Caesar's particular passions and actions, his passionate sense-making, we could say, can claim a kind of futurity, 
in relation to the historical present in which he's acting. The complex logic of his situation is such that in acting, firstly, in the interest of his particular drives and aims, he is at the same time acting, though perhaps not with perfect consciousness, Secondly, in response to, quote, a determination that in itself was necessary, both in Rome's history and the history of the world. This combination of individual and historical logics involves a heightened creativity in producing forms of action that will become paradigmatic for, for a specific social historical reality that's just taken hold. Caesar's actions are creative in drawing quote, not on the steady ordered course of things as it has been hallowed by the established system, but rather on a source whose content is hidden, not yet having ripened to a present existence, end quote. Um, the quote goes on, this content comes from the inward and as yet still subterranean spirit that thumps from within against the external world as upon the peel of a fruit until at last it breaks through. For it is a new core, and not the same one the peel originally enclosed. End of quote. I mean, this is all about the great men history, right? But I mean, I invite you to think about, um, you know, liberation, social liberation movements of the past 50 years or so, uh, and the kind of uh, innovative action and forms of actions, forms of being a person that that has generated all the resistance, all the supposed immorality of that, uh, and, and maybe where we are today in, in the history of these kinds of uh, movements of, of liberation and self-legitimation. The contrast between Cato and Caesar illustrates what Hegel must have in mind when he says that when it comes to their moral value, quote, those who have resisted what the progress of the idea of spirit has made necessary, those who have resisted progress stand higher in terms of ethical character and their noble disposition than those whose crimes have in a higher order been converted into means of accomplishing the will of that higher order. And a less obvious, but I think philosophically more interesting way, the same point is illustrated by the contrast between Socrates and the fictional character Antigone. Remember that inasmuch as Sophocles is Socrates' contemporary, so is his dramatic creation, Antigone. Though one is an historical person and the other a dramatic character, Socrates and Antigone are both reflections of the ethical life of 5th century Athens and its uncertainties. Development raises the limits with the question of the limits within which people are able to revise the existing scenarios or action frameworks that underlie their autonomous action and make sense of it. He puts it in terms of authenticity. Quote, some revisions in our way of life would leave us with scenarios that we cannot enact or cannot enact authentically. Evoking J.S. Mill's notion of experiments and living, Development suggests that rational progress takes place when agents are able to discover resources within the present way of life that they can draw upon to make sense of themselves and others in ways that are new and at least to some extent unprecedented. However, he also concedes that, quote, in extreme cases, our existing way of life may afford no intelligible way of implementing reforms that would clearly make it more intelligible. Hegel's understanding of Antigone and Socrates, respectively, is an interesting case in point. While both lives end in suicide, Antigone fails in her world to revise the forms of sense-making, whereas Socrates in his way succeeds. Antigone's experiment and ethical innovation reveals the pastness of an entire way of life. Socrates' experiment opens onto a future that, from Hegel's experience, at least stretches into the Enlightenment and beyond. Let's begin with Antigone, whom we ought to understand, to my mind, as representing an essentially conservative mindset. She's an epitome of the moral attitude, committed with her whole self to upholding a law which, as she, uh, which, as she says, lives not just yesterday and today, but everlastingly, and no one knows the time from whence it has come. The drama comes about because upholding the laws of family is the only way Antigone finds she can meaningfully act. Civil war in Thebes has now thrust her into an unprecedented situation in which she must improvise or indeed innovate 
in ways that set her on a collision course with precisely the ethical norms and social roles in whose defense she acts. And acting any other way, she would relinquish the very free, real freedom and autonomy she possesses, and which consists in the intelligibility and self-transparency of the reasons in response to which she forms her intentions. The tragedy is that the logic of her conservative value commitments has been rendered incoherent by the processes of historical change epitomized by Oedipus' unnatural crime against family and state and its aftermath. She can neither relinquish her freedom nor realize it. Like Cato, she responds to this, the destruction of the final purpose of her world and the supreme order of things by committing suicide. Unlike Cato, however, Antigone fails to make her suicide into a final act of affirming the constitutive condition of action. Because we suffer, she says, we recognize that we erred. Anna Ken. I do not take Antigone's recognition here to express or constitute an insight. On contrary, it's the expression of a total loss of intelligibility. Her commitment to the law of blood ties, the so-called divine law, has pushed her outside the ambit of the traditional gender roles that are undoubtedly a basic feature of her way of life, but that in itself obviously need not lead to tragedy. The tragedy, tragedy lies in the ultimate destruction of the framework of personal and institutional values that are the substantive objects of the moral attitude, and it's also the destruction of the framework of intelligibility in which Antigone can be an autonomous agent. I mean, everybody is dead at the end, the whole family is destroyed. In the end, Antigone cannot make sense of her actions except in the highly attenuated form of accepting her fate as divine punishment. But there's nothing redeeming about the way she ends. Cato embodies Roman virtue in taking his life. Antigone betrays Greek virtue in taking hers. Cato's defeat remains, in a sense, external to his sense of self, while Antigone suffers a much more devastating defeat of intelligibility. Now consider Socrates. Socrates, for all his professed, professed devotion to the laws of Athens, is not at heart a conservative figure. At least on Hegel's view, the logic of Socrates' way of living and acting is fundamentally incompatible with Athenian life, mores, and laws, even though in many ways he epitomizes the individualistic excellence that for Hegel characterizes Periclean Athens. It's also interesting to note that, again on Hegel's portrayal of the matter, Socrates' defense of himself before the Athenian court, his attitude to the verdict, and his actions while imprisoned, imprisoned veer into incoherence. And they do so in a way that demonstrates nothing more than it does arrogance and selfish pride. In any case, Hegel believes that given Socrates' actions and his behavior toward the court, the Athenians had no choice but to execute him, and that they were fully justified in doing so. In other words, Socrates' actions are at least illegal, and from the point of view of his fellow citizens embedded in the traditional framework of Athenian life, they would be better described as impious and immoral, so wicked. It's not just that Socrates' accusers are, ju are justified in defending the ethical order against a person they see as posing a grave danger to it. It's that Socrates himself, in his words and actions, occasionally veers into incoherence because the sense-making scenario in which he finds his reasons for acting is partially still the one shared by his uh, accusers, the conservative citizens of Athens. To this extent, Socrates really is a bad actor. It's not just a question of whose perspective we take, the Athenian courts, or that of Socrates' friends. He's objectively a bad actor. Clearly, though, in all his actions, Socrates has been perfectly free. Free in the sense relevant here, namely in acting systematically toward the aim of intelligibility and self-understanding, and indeed accomplishing that aim despite the patches of incoherence. Socrates presents an especially interesting case in the present context because he is, as always here on Hegel's view of the matter, the first so-called hero of spirit to have grasped the inner propulsiveness of human reason and to have understood that both the objects of knowledge and the norms of action are, in an important sense, the products of human reason itself. They're nonetheless objective and binding character notwithstanding. In this respect, 
Socratic thought differs importantly from that of sophists like Protagoras with their man is the measure doctrine, which Hegel pretty obviously considers to spring from the very root of evil. Nevertheless, what brings Socrates into conflict with Athenian morality is precisely his insistence on the underlying aim of intelligibility and its equally constitutive and normative significance for action. One of Socrates' most notable interests is in showing the inner identity of insight into the basic forms of intelligibility, knowledge, and virtue. Socrates' world historical significance is chiefly owing to his discovery, if you will, of this underlying truth about action, reason, freedom, and normativity. And is still partially inchoate, partially incoherent, but otherwise paradigmatic fashion, Socrates is already living by and thereby creating a kind of norm that, from the perspective of his historical present, has futuric significance. It is, so to speak, ethical life the day after tomorrow. But just because he is, in this respect, ahead of his time, Socrates acting from the mode of intelligibility and universality is particular, idiosyncratic, non-conforming, and outwardly unintelligible in its actuality, in short, wicked. Not to put too fine a point on it, Socrates splendidly personifies the wickedness at the heart of individual autonomy and conscience. As Hegel tells the story, Socrates is to the intellectual history of Europe, but Adam and Eve are to the history of redemption, the original sin of self-consciousness, without which nothing. There's no doubt a sense in which the figure of Socrates can be described as tragic. As Hegel sees it, the clash with Athenian morality is a genuine moral conflict. Each side is, in its one-sided way, right, and the destruction, therefore, inevitable. But if we contrast him with Antigone, Socrates enjoys by far the better fate of the two. One might say that Socrates' fate combines, <laughs> combines features of the fates of Cato and Caesar. Like them, Socrates goes to his death as a wholehearted, integral person with a unified, agential identity, deeply at one with himself and the objectivity of his life and opinions, at once both so Athenian and so unAthenian. His suicide is like Cato's an affirmation of the underlying constitutive norm of intelligibility and self-understanding. More than that, Socrates' death demonstrates the robustness of his particular vision and realization of sense-making, even in the face of social disharmony and personal destruction. And like Caesar, in turn, Socrates embodies the present futurity of a new regime of intelligibility and ethical order. He's a creative moral force, not despite, but because of his Athenian immorality. That comes to my conclusion. Hegel's attitude toward Jacobi is sufficiently complex and idiosyncratic that we may never get all the way to the bottom of it, certainly not with a historical distance that separates us. One thing is clear, though. Hegel resists what he rightly or probably wrongly sees as Jacobi's uh, promotion of arbitrary, unprincipled, subjective particularity and his exaggerated criticism of reason and the structures Hegel assumes under the general title of mediation. That's a recurring motif throughout Hegel's engagement with Jacobi and remains invariant across his various shifts in attitude and tone. Exercising the caution due when projecting contemporary philosophical debates back into historical philosophical debates, I've suggested that Hegel might have been misled by elements in Jacobi's view that bring him close to what nowadays could be described as moral particularism. While I do not believe that Jacobi was a moral particularist, even if he had been, Hegel's criticism on that account would have been rash. That ethics without principle should be impossible and any move in that direction consequently an immediate threat to moral life and integrity is not obvious. Contemporary work in this area, I think, shows as much. And even though Jacobi's language frequently accentuates so-called subjective faculties and attitudes like feeling of faith, it's clear that Jacobi himself embraced a version of moral objectivism. In the meantime, I think the relation between the two philosophers comes into slightly better focus when we pay attention to the difference between a no principles view and a view like Velleman's aims-based constitutivism, which does not dissociate generalizable moral principles from the reality of moral deliberation and action, but also does not make them constitutive features at the very heart of agency and autonomous action. Certainly, neither Jacobi nor Hegel is a principles-first type thinker. 
Moreover, both have a lively sense for the ways that freedom has the potential to bring people into conflict with established moral norms and principles. We act under the constraint of intelligibility and self-understanding, but that constraint, though normative in a broad sense, is not inherently moral. It doesn't determine autonomous action per se as conformable to the right, even though there may be all kinds of deep reasons why there will still be a strong general tendency for autonomy to favor morality. Bellman's kind of Kantian strategy is a good example of an approach that puts rational intelligibility first and then seeks to explain morality as a form of rational progress, as he says. A form of rational progress that naturally develops wherever autonomous agents seek cooperation and mutual intelligibility. Whatever the details of such a developmental story turn out to be, it's an important truth that action involves not only aims, specifically the aim of intelligibility, but also that improvisation, revision, and innovation are deeply rooted and necessary features of freedom. Really, that combination of intelligibility-directed purposiveness and innovative creativity is freedom's vital element. In this last respect, Hegel seems to me to succeed better than Jacobi and bring it all together into a unified theory, into a unified theory of autonomous action that can illuminate a broad range of observations from moral experience in human history. The crux lies, I think, in the way Hegel is able to combine thoughts about teleology and the purposive nature of reason with a conception of freedom as transparency, and Hegel's phrase, being at one with oneself in the other. Because Hegel explicitly makes this link and gives a sustained defense of his priority over the kinds of relations that are structured by principles and which Kant and much of the tradition before him favored, Hegel is in a much better position to acknowledge and in a certain sense explain moral disagreement, conflicting moral reasons, and the role of spiritual creativity in moving beyond them. That's not the whole story behind Hegel's interest in the reality of evil and its root in human freedom. But I think it is an important part of that story. Thank you.